How do you pick up uh, insider trading? We do use computer algorithms and we do catch people. What do you think is the biggest investment mistake? I'll give you a couple. They need to diversify, need to keep costs low, um, and they need to not panic. The SEC pays government salaries, uh, which are, let's say, modest to say the least. I think our people have the respect of Wall Street. Well, they are respected, and if anybody's watching this in the SEC is looking at anything I might be filing, yes, they're very good <laughs> people. I was trying to get them a raise. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist, and nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? Let's talk about the SEC and the job of being the chairman of the SEC. Uh, you were a lawyer in private practice. What is the biggest change in uh, your life now that you're doing this? Well, I think, I think the biggest change is that, is that my client is different, and my client is the American investor. And that is, a, that is a change from having a single client to having a group of clients. But it can't be that stressful job. I see you have no gray hair. So <laughs> is that uh, genetic or just uh, good fortune or <laughs> job is not that stressful? It's a good makeup. Okay. <laughs> when people say to you, I want to invest in security A or security B, you say, well, that's not something I can advise you on. I can just give you general principles. Is that what you say? That's exactly what I say. Okay, well, maybe I should be chairman of the SEC. <laughs> okay. You have said that you think that smaller investors, maybe through their 401ks or IRAs, should be able to invest in illiquid securities. Is there any progress towards that? We, we, are, we are studying it. Our private investment market has grown substantially in the last 20 years. You know this. Um, in fact, last year, more capital was raised in the private markets than in the public markets. And our retail investors, people who are not qualified investors, aren't having access to those investment opportunities. And over some periods of time, those investment opportunities perform better than the public capital markets. So we're, we're, we're looking at this, and we want to make sure that retail is not left behind. Now, in the investment world, for the last four or five years or so, people have been worried that another recession is going to come. Nobody is really predicting a recession tomorrow that I'm aware of. But you recently made a speech in which you said leveraged loans are relatively high and reminded you of 2008. What is your concern about leveraged loan market? Well. Let me, let me clarify, because I'm not saying that the leveraged loan market today reminds me of 2008. What I said about 2008 was there were mismatches in expectations and economic realities. In 2008, we thought that you know, not all mortgages would move in the same direction. They did. You know, we thought that a guarantee fee at the GSEs of 25 basis points was right for all mortgages. It wasn't. You know, then you look at my job, you look around and you say, where are expectations and realities out of whack. And one place that they, that they may be is that leverage loans don't settle like bonds. It takes a while to transfer a leverage loan. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to sell me a bond, we would settle three days later. If you want to sell me a leverage loan, it might settle 15 days later, it might settle 30 days later. If people think that those loans are as liquid as bonds, they may be wrong. Um, so you don't want a high concentration of those leverage loans in a liquidity product like a mutual fund. That's what I was saying. Is there anything else you're worried about right now? I've been worried about Brexit, uh, a hard Brexit. A hard Brexit, I think, would have significant economic effects. Uh, we've asked our registrants, our public companies, to describe what, what a Brexit or a hard Brexit would do to their, their operations. And th there'll be some significant changes in people's operations. Now, you've also written your word about cyber risk. We still have a ways to go on preparation. There are, there are a number of what I would say, single points of failure in our uh, information economy that we need to make sure are resilient. Um, the ones we worry about are exchanges, clearing houses, large banks. You know, if there's a cyber problem, are they able to get up and running quickly? And that, that we need to move to where we're more comfortable um, that that's happening. In 1997, 
roughly 20 years ago or so, there were about, I think, twice as many companies that were public as there are today. I think maybe 7,200 then and maybe something like half that now. So is that because the SEC is too tough on companies? They don't want to go public because of all the constraints that you impose on them? Or is it because of other factors in the market? So I, I think that there are, there are a number of factors. Um, one of them is regulation. Um, another one is the emergence of private investment opportunities, private equity, credit for private equity. Uh, another is consolidation. But each of those three has contributed to that reduction. Um, what I don't like is that companies are not choosing to go public early in their life cycle. We're seeing companies in, with you know, high valuations going public, but not nearly as many in the, what I'll say, 500 million to 2 why billion. Do, why, don't, why do you care? Why do you not like that if they wait to their much bigger in valuation? Because I'd, I want our retail investors to get a chance to invest in those companies when they're growing it's, it's great to invest in a $20 billion company. It's really nice to invest in that $20 billion company when it was $2 billion two years ago. Many people are confused about one thing about the SEC, and I'd say non-professionals. They think that the SEC says this is a good investment, not a good investment. But your mission has really been to just make sure people are adequately uh, getting information for full disclosure. Is that fair? That's, that's correct. Two, two principal things. Transparency. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna participate in our markets, if you're gonna sell securities, you have to be transparent and you have to be honest. And then in trading securities, we can't have un, unfair practices, manipulation. That, those are the, the SEC's core missions. And so when somebody files to go public, they file what's called an S1 document. And uh, some people say you have to put so much information in it that it discourages people from wanting to go public. Um, is it possible that you could say we don't need all this information or you think what you're doing now is working? I, th I think the approach is the right approach, which is give us all the material information about your company when you're, when you're going public. That, that's the right, that is the right approach. Should we have the same amount of disclosure for our largest companies that we do for those smaller and medium-sized companies? Probably not. I mean, you know, the, the mega global companies, they need to provide us with much more information than the bi startup biotech does. And what, what we're trying to do at the SEC now is say, like, can we scale our disclosure requirements in a way that makes it more accessible for those medium and small sized companies? Now, if you are a publicly traded company, every quarter you file information with the SEC updating investors on developments in the previous quarter. Um, what about just doing it every six months as opposed to every quarter? I, I know that's been debated. You have a view on whether that's a good or bad idea? Well, quarterly rep listen, markets thirst for information. Investors thirst for information. They, they want information on a regular basis. Um, I don't expect that quarterly reporting will go away anytime soon. Our, if you borrow money from a bank, at the same time as you're still selling stock, that bank's gonna want quarterly information. I don't, I don't know many loan documents that have semi-annual information. So we have, but the, the real question for us is, do you need to do something as extensive every quarter as we require today? Because you know what happens? People take this quarterly report, say the one that would be filed in June, and they compare it to the March quarterly report. And all they really wanna know is you know, what's in the press release, the earnings press release, and what are the changes? And yet we make people file a very large document. So we might be able to do something that's more streamlined on a quarterly basis. Now, when you were a lawyer, you had very highly compensated associates and partners working with you on behalf of companies. The SEC pays government salaries, uh, which are, let's say, modest, to say the least. I wondered, can you really get good people to stay there because you don't pay them that much? Yes. We, we have terrific people. We really do. Um, okay. It's, and it's, they can keep up with the, the private sector uh, bar and things like that that are filing information all the time in the investment banks? I think, you, you tell me, I think our people have the respect of Wall Street. Well, they are respected. And if anybody's watching this in the SEC is looking at anything I might be filing, yes, they're very good. They're terrific <laughs> people. And they do a great job. I just wonder whether they're so undercompensated. I was trying to get them a raise. Well, you know what? If, 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 if you can help, them, help me get them a raise, okay. let's do it. Let's suppose I'm sitting in an emergency room of a hospital and somebody wheels in the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Can I go and call my broker and say, I think the markets are going to go down because he's a very popular person. Um, can I trade on that? Well, it's, it's a great question because that does show the line. Like, wh where do we draw the fairness line?
let's go through uh, insider trading for a moment. The Supreme Court has ruled on a couple occasions against the SEC, arguing that you were too tough, I guess, on in enforcing the law. Is that a fair reading? Well, we just won that. We just won one the other day, which felt pretty good. Okay, but had you not lost a few in the Supreme Court? There, there were there were a few that we lost. And the SEC's main argument is. Uh, that the courts misinterpreted the law when, when you lose, or how did you? No, I think, I, I, look, I, insider trading is actually um, a, a very delicate enforcement uh, issue. Because you could have a rule that said, any time that you have information that everyone else doesn't, you can't trade. You know, any time you have material non-public information, um, you can't trade. Well, that would discourage people from finding out things about companies. And one of the policing mechanisms in our market is private investors going and looking at companies and whether they're telling the truth or not. So we want to encourage that kind of behavior. We want to encourage people to investigate companies. The theory is that it's, everybody should have access to the same information. So if you're a corporate CEO and you tell me, a private citizen, you're about to buy a company at a big premium, I'm not supposed to take that information and go buy stock because it's unfair to the market. Correct. All right. Let's suppose I'm sitting in an emergency room of a hospital, uh, waiting to, you know, just have some something looked at by an emergency room person. I'm not really that ill, and somebody wheels in the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and the person says this person's had a fatal heart attack or a potentially fatal heart attack, very serious. And I see the person being wheeled in. Um, can I go and call my broker and say I think the markets are going to go down because he's a very popular person? Um, can I trade on that? Well, it's, it's a great question because that does show the line. Like, wh where do we draw the fairness line? If you're the doctor, you know, you, we would say you ha have a duty to keep information about the you know, Fed person confidential, and no one would expect you to trade on uh, information you obtained by being a doctor. But if you happen to be standing there at the emergency room when uh, he or she gets wheeled in, uh, that's, that information you didn't acquire in any nefarious way or any trust or confidence way, um, and you should be able to trade on that just like if you saw people loading bricks instead of computers into, a, into the back of a truck. Okay, suppose somebody um, is a corporate CEO, and they mentioned to me that he or she is a big company. They're going to pull out of uh, Britain because of Brexit. They're not happy with, and that will have a big deleterious effect on the British economy. Is it okay to take that information and short the pound? Because that, let's say this information would short the pound or make the pound go down. Is that a problem? Because um, it's not a security. You can buy and, and trade uh, dollar bills or pounds. Is that a problem for the well, SEC if I did that? We, we don't police non-securities transactions like that. So a, a currency transaction would be outside of okay. our jurisdiction. So you would say, I did that, that's okay? It, uh, it, 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 the answer is, it, it depends. Okay. Uh, but, All right. All right. but you know what? Check with your lawyer. Okay. Um, <laughs> what about um, cryptocurrencies? You've said they are not um, securities. Is that right? Uh, I mean, like Bitcoin. Well, well, just because you call something a cryptocurrency doesn't mean it's not a security. Oh. We, we've seen a lot of things that people call a cryptocurrency that are in fact securities. But you referenced. One Bitcoin, which we we have looked at, and is is okay. not a, is not a security. So the average person, explain to the average person, how many members of the SEC are there? Uh, we have 45, 4,600 employees. Okay, and how many commissioners? There are five commissioners, and they're all appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. And uh, did you have to be from a certain party or not? Uh, I believe the way the rule reads, you cannot have more than three from the same party. So let's talk about how you came to be the chairman of the SEC. You grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, initially? Initially, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And your father worked for Hershey? Um, my father worked for Hershey. Actually, we were outside, outside of Hershey. And but did you get a lot of chocolate or for free? Or? So much that we got sick of it. Really? Yeah. So you didn't like it that much? In but, I, okay. but I like it now. Okay, so you then initially went to Lafayette College and you played soccer. Yep. And then you transferred to University of Pennsylvania. That's right. And did you play soccer anymore? Or? Uh, a little bit, but only, I, was, I was a marginal college soccer player. Okay, and then you uh, graduated summa cum laude, which is pretty good. So then you uh, went to Cambridge and then you played basketball at Cambridge? They're shorter. In you came back and you went to University of Pennsylvania Law School. Mm -hmm. 
and you did very well top, near the top of your class. You clerked for a federal judge, and then you went to Sullivan and Cromwell, one of the most successful uh, law firms in the United States. And then all of a sudden, you become chairman of the uh, SEC. Were you known to the president? Did you know President Trump? No. It's actually an interesting story. A, a client of mine uh, asked me to go to Trump Tower to brief some people on the transition and how our capital markets were functioning and areas for improvement. Um, and one thing led to another. And after a few days, uh, went well, through some interviews, and then, and then I interviewed with the president. OK. Did he have any tough questions, tougher than mine? or? You're pretty good. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but so he, um, I was told that he was very impressed with you. And he said, this person looks like he should be the chairman of the SEC. Were you surprised that he offered you the job? Mm, we, we, we had a really good discussion. OK. We had a, was I, I think you're always surprised when you're offered a job like this. Okay, so the president proposed that you become the chairman of the SEC. And when you do that, you have to sell all your securities, you have to give up your partnership statement. Yeah, they didn't tell me all that. They didn't tell you that? <laughs> so um, today, does the Congress bother you on a day-to-day -day basis? They say, go regulate this or do that? or um, You know what? I, every minute I spend up there is valuable. Because it's real, it, it is really good to hear from members and senators um, from, from both parties what they think we should be doing. It's good to know how someone looks at you when they, when they and they, you know, they're, they're my board of directors. Does the, does the White House or the president, they call you with advice or suggestions or not that much? Not so much. So would you like them to call you more or not so much? Uh, I, th I like things the way they are. And when you're relaxing, what are you doing these days? I played soccer the other day with my kids and I couldn't walk for the... <laughs> not a golfer. I, I, wa I, I was more of a golfer before I took this job. But if you played now, you would find that people would give you the putts a lot more than you would have thought before. Don't you ever thought about that? <laughs> I must be playing with the wrong people. Okay. <laughs>
we do use computer algorithms to analyze trading to see if there's trading that you know, doesn't make sense. Um, and, we, and we do catch people. So from your current position, what do you think is the biggest investment mistake that you think investors make? I'll give you a couple. They need to diversify, need to keep costs low, um, and they need to not panic. One of the big mistakes people make is that when they see their investment goes down, they sell, which often that's the best time to buy. But you need a long-term plan, you need to keep your costs down, and you need to stay diversified. Now, sometimes people at the SEC say that fees that are being charged by investment managers are too high. Is that uh, a general view of yours or the SEC, or you're not that worried about that? Um, I, th I think that I believe in the power of shopping. And I think that when fees are transparent and people get a chance to shop around, um, everyone benefits. Today, as you look at uh, the job you have, are you glad you took the job? And what's the best thing about being chairman of the SEC and serving your country in this way? And what's the worst thing about it, other than an interview like this? <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very glad I took the job. I'm very glad I took the job. I, I believe in our markets. They, they are the best markets in the world. We need to keep. We need to keep updating them. We need to keep current. We need to keep that competitive advantage for America. Um, and our markets, you know, the participation in our markets is incredible. Um, 50 million households participate in our markets. Um, you know, the best part about it is trying to make a difference for those 50 million households every day. Now, you have three children who are in uh, school. At now, and they're in New York area where you're from, and so you commute down during the week and you go back on weekends. So on weekends, I assume a lot of your friends are the investment business or the legal uh, business. Do they come up to you and say, you got any uh, good insights I could get from you as the chairman of the SEC, or what do you, you can't talk to your friends about anything you do anymore? Um, I used to not talk to my friends about what I did before. Okay, all right. <laughs> So you have a lot of friends. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> now that you've served in the government uh, for a number of years, um, do you like it so much that you might consider, I suppose the President called you and said, you've done such a great job, I'd like you to do another job. Would you consider another job, or you're very happy where you are? Uh, you know, I, I decided to do this job, um, and I'm really not thinking about what's next. I, I think I, I got some good advice from my wife. She said, do the job, don't think about what's next, because um, then you won't have your mind on the job. Now, your wife was in the investment business, and when you took this position, she had to Get out of that? She had to, yes. She wasn't forced to, but. But you thought it was a good idea to do that? The, we thought it was the right thing to do. And the biggest surprise you've had in the job is what? Um, how, how much ground the 4,500 women and men at the SEC cover. I mean, it's $72 trillion a year in transactions. Uh, a million people in our country work in the securities industry, and you know, they're, they're counting on us to to set the rules in the right way and enforce them. And, and they, they just cover a lot of ground. And when you're relaxing, what are you doing these days? Do you play golf? Are you basketball still, soccer? What do you do? Um, well, I played, I played soccer the other day with my kids, and I couldn't walk. For the <laughs> <laughs> so we're going you know, to slow down on that. Um, you're I, not a golfer. I, 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 I was more of a golfer before I took this job. But if you played now, you would find the people would give you the putts a lot more than you would have thought before. Don't you ever thought about that? I must be playing with the wrong people. OK. <laughs> well, thank you very much for an interesting conversation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jay, for doing this. David, thank, thank you. you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.